Let's uh, open with a word of prayer, please. Thanks again, Father, for loving us so much. And uh, I'm just so grateful that you know everything that's going on. And uh, it's serious, and yet at the same time, I almost have to laugh. But uh, uh, again, just so thankful that you know. And uh, so we pray for America. <clears throat> thank you again for the fact we live in this community, we live in this area, and I especially thank you for these people that are here today. And their dedication, willingness to uh, be and hear your word, and especially be with Steve as he shares that word with us this morning, and with Pastor and Jenny as they're uh, once again getting a test to see what their uh, status is as far as this virus goes. I uh, just want to say we love you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for loving us. And we'll sing again unto you as we do each Sunday songs of praise and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple songs again today. Uh, one and all hymn.
second job, I guess. Uh, I feel for Pastor and Jenny. They had the test. They just can't get the results. And uh, uh, Pastor said, uh, first they said it would be five to eight days. I think something like that, seven or eight days. And then it ended up being eight to ten days. And they still haven't heard uh, as of yesterday. So, so I get prepared, and then he lets me know if I'm on or off. So <laughs> I guess we're on again. Um, you know, Terry mentioned something about when we get back to normal. I'm not sure what that's going to be. Uh, you know, we don't have any idea what how long this thing's going to last or how they're going to how it's going to play out. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, you hear all kinds of reports on wearing the mask is bad for you, and I think if you wear it too long, it probably is. Uh, I heard just you know, yesterday or the day before that. Some people are getting Legionnaire's disease, which is caused by, you know, poor air circulation from wearing the mask. So you're trying to prevent one and get something else, I guess. But anyway, be that as it may, we'll just have to do our best to do our duty to obey our government as long as they don't try and shut us down from uh, doing what we do here. And uh, you know, we're told to obey our, the authorities over us. So we're going to do that to the best of our ability. And I agree with Terry. I think the pastor and, and the worship team, when they're up here, I don't see any need for the mask. But then when we're down together, I guess starting next Sunday, we all have to be wearing masks. That's the, the dictate. So we'll do our best to comply. If you would turn to Ephesians chapter 2, a very familiar passage and uh, one we've looked at before, but uh, I just think it's uh, it's crucial in today as we're facing so many different things that we're, we've never seen before. But uh, God's workmanship, God's workmanship. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're His workmanship. You know, the Apostle explains that as much as we like to think we're, you know, you talk about people and being a self-made man or self-made person. You know, if that's the case, uh, you're on the wrong track because we have to be a God-made person. We have to be part of God's workmanship. Um, changed lives bear witness to the power that God has over life. And uh, Paul here, he has three phases in which this is visible. And, and the first is the past predicament. And we look at verse 1. He says, you know, we were, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And uh, this is man's basic problem. But we have a sin problem. And every person who's born into this world is born with that same problem. Uh, and we're born separated from God by our sins. Uh, it's a, you know, it's something that we all suffer from, and we all deal with, and it's a condition that everyone has. Romans 3, 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now what does that, what does that mean? How does God deal with someone who's too young to understand yet? Well, I believe God has provisions for that. I believe God has provisions for those who maybe are incapable of understanding. But uh, we don't know how God works in the minds of those who are, uh, we think, maybe incapable of learning, incapable, incapable 
of understanding. Uh, we don't know. We have no clue how God works in that. But we know how we see it. That may not be the way it is at all. Um, but sin is as real as cancer. It's there. We can't get rid of it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how good we try to be, it has nothing to do with how good we are. You know, if it was a matter of how good we are, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and give His life on the cross. And see, man is constantly trying to live up to some standard that they can't live up to. The Ten Commandments were not given to us to be a set of rules that you live by these rules. They're, they're, they're given to us to understand God's standard. And also, in the book of Galatians, it says it was our schoolmaster, our teacher, to do what? To show us that we couldn't measure up to God's standard. We couldn't live up to it no matter how hard we tried. That's to point us to Jesus, the only one who could measure up to God's standard and then give us His righteousness. Well, we got to face the fact, uh, you know, whether you're becoming a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous or turning to God, whatever it is, whatever you're trying to do, uh, we have to forget the past predicament and realize that, uh, you know, Romans 7.18 says this, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now the Apostle Paul at one point called himself the chief of sinners. Uh, and he said he told us another time that, you know, the thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the thing I don't want to do, that's what I find it easiest to do. Well, don't we all struggle with that type of thing? Because that sin nature is still here. Even if we belong to Christ, we still have that sin nature that we deal with every day. Well, uh, our past associations, uh, our past reveals a life that is uh, opposed to God, contrary to God. Verses 2 and 3 says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also... We all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. So that was our past life. Uh, the results of our, our past predicament uh, are summed up in John 3.36, which says, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, that's the only two ways there are. There's only two choices there are. Either you believe the Son and you have eternal life, or you reject the Son and you have eternal separation from God. That's only two choices. And you know, there are people out there among us and around us that need to hear that message. And uh, we need to live a life that is exemplary and shows Christ to others. But we need to tell them too. Uh, the book of Romans says, how are they, how they going to hear without a preacher to tell them? without someone to, to bring the message of the gospel to those who don't know Christ. So that's our past predicament. Now how about our present life? Verses 4 through 6 says this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now you know our, our eternal life begins the moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Although it's not culminated until we go to be with Him. Whether we meet Him in the air or whether we uh, die and then are raised when He comes back at the rapture to take all believers to be with Him. Um, you know, this is... Uh, this is the, the end for the Christian. It, it, it's, the, it's the end of this. It's the beginning of our true eternal life when we're finally fully redeemed and changed into that which is incorruptible. Uh, you know, there's a, someone said, uh, mercy pities and grace pardons. Mercy pities and grace pardons. You see, God, through His grace, and it mentions it a couple times in this passage, for by grace have you been saved. By the grace of God. What is that? Well, that means not giving us what we deserve. You know, there, there are people, even now, protesting because they want what they deserve. They better thank God they don't get what they deserve. 
if we all got what we deserve, we'd be spending eternity in hell, separated from God. That's what we deserve. But thank God, by His grace, He offered us a plan, a plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, and we can have a way out. But we see, you know, around us now, I don't know if we've ever seen a time in our lifetimes when evil has been so exemplified as what we're seeing in the protests and the, the anarchy and the uh, you know, just being plain evil as we're seeing right now. It, it's, uh, it's a time when, you know, we should be a little concerned about what's happening, but yet remember God is still in control. These people may want control and you know, I, don't, I have no idea how this is all going to play out. They may eventually get control. You know, a lot depends on how the selection goes. Uh, so, you know, we really don't know the future, but God does. And we can always depend on Him to know the future and to be able to say, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And it's God. And He has total control of that. So uh, we have a new life that was made possible uh, because of this verse, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did He wait till we were good enough? No, if He had, He'd still be waiting. He died for us when we were as sinful as we could possibly be. And what sins were paid for at the cross? Was it just, okay, all the sins before I trusted Christ? No, it was all of our sins. All of our sins have been paid for. Because you see, we still do sin as believers. Now hopefully that's getting less and less as we mature as believers. And, and sin has less and less uh, influence in our lives. But we belong to Christ. So what happens to the believer then if... 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, both talk about the judgment seat of Christ where we will stand before Christ and give an account of our lives as believers. What have I done for Christ? Where did I fail? Where did I fall short? What opportunities did I miss? We're going to give an account. And I believe, I believe there's going to be tears shed at the judgment seat of Christ when we realize all that we could have been and how far short we fall. Because we fail. We fail every day. But you know, thank God, by His grace, He not only saves us, but He also keeps us and enables us to serve Him and live for Him. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. Uh, one, one person once said uh, about Christians, says, when you have on your best suit, uh, remember who paid for it. In other words, when you're, when you're doing your best as a believer in Christ, remember who paid for that opportunity for you to live like that. You know, the Bible tells us we're not our own. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're not our own. We belong to Him who shed His precious blood to save us. And so many times we get caught up in life and we forget, you know, uh, what am I doing? I'm kind of going along like everybody else. When in reality, I should be living to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus Christ and what He's done for them. And enable them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ also. Or at least hear it. You can't, you know, I had a, had a situation Friday evening in the caboose at, at uh, Wabash. I had nine teenage boys. I'm guessing, judging from the way they were acting, and uh, they were probably about junior high age. I told you, I saw I gave my eyes and you know, that was the most discouraging group I've ever talked to. They wouldn't listen. They were talking over me. They were making fun of things. Although when I asked them to bow their heads and pray, the one, one was still making noises and doing everything he could to distract. But one of the boys did raise his hand and came and they prayed to receive Christ amongst all the turmoil. But you know how frustrating it was wanting them to hear the gospel and knowing that you know, this is what you need. This is the answer to life. And, and to have so much just plain interference. Uh, and, and it is. 
it is a little discouraging from our standpoint, but you know, God is still the one who takes that message and all we have to do is be faithful in telling people and God will take the message. The Holy Spirit takes that message and pricks the heart and the conscience and convicts them of their sin. I don't have to do that, thank God, because I could have wrapped them on the head very easily. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't. I was patient. It was tough. But, you know, that, that's, the way, that's the way we are before we come to Christ. We're rebellious. And we're, we're against God. And we may be the loveliest people on earth to other people around us. But you know, God knows what's on the inside. God knows the heart. And He knows what we're really like. And you know, that's, a, that's something that we all have to deal with. Um, Romans 6, 1, 4, 1 through 4 says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You know, we're to, we're to be different people than we were. If there's no change, you better look and see. Have I really trusted Christ as my Savior? Because there should be a difference in the way we live, the way we walk, the way we talk. So, you know, uh, there's an old song that says this, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I claim. You know, the effect of God's action is seen in a way that, that uh, in which we live, how we live out our salvation. It isn't a matter of just trusting Christ and then saying, I'm saved, you know, I'm going to float along here until the rapture occurs or maybe if I live in, to an old age and die, uh, you know, then this is over. You know, we're to be doing work for Him now and serving Him now in this present age. Uh, our new life uh, and, and the works that we do as believers validates that new birth. It doesn't save us. The works never have saved us. They never were intended to save us. If they could, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. That was not the intent of our good works that, that we see. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit in a minute here. But, uh, you know, we should eagerly join in worship and study and ministry and, you know, do these things. We're, you know, this is our mission Sunday, and we, we support missionaries that are out there sharing the gospel. And as one of those missionaries, I can tell you one thing, this has been the most difficult year we've ever had. It's difficult to get uh, five-day clubs for my summer missionary. It's been difficult to, for us. Well, we've only been at two places so far, and that was at Etna Green for a very, very short festival. And then Wabash Fair, we were there all week, but uh, the crowd was well, up where we were at. It was just a very slim crowd. And then, you know, we only get a small percentage of the crowd anyway, so when you slim that crowd down, it really makes our numbers tough. But, you know, all we can do is minister to the ones that the Lord brings in. We can't, we can't dictate a lot of things. We can't change the, the whole uh, tenor of what's going on right now. But God does still work. I think we had two that professed faith in Christ this week. The interesting thing, both of them were teenage boys. Uh, and you know, that, it was interesting that they would even come in. Uh, but you know, what we're expected to do and what we do oftentimes are two different things. You know, when, when Christ left, you know, he, he said, you're my witnesses. You know, you're, you're the ones that are left. He isn't here physically anymore. The Holy Spirit is here living and indwelling believers and convicting sinners of, of their sins. But you know what? We are the ones that have to be, in fact, we're called ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You know, are we, are we doing our job as ambassadors? Are we telling others? Are we living a life that shows what we believe and gives us opportunity then to give the reason for the hope which is in us. You know, that should be the whole goal of, of living a good life. It isn't just to be a nice person. It's to 
reach others with the gospel and be able to share with them and tell them. So that's our present life. Now, what about our future promise? Verses 7 through 10. And in this, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, This promise has two parts. You know, what he shows and what we show. He shows the riches of his grace. Um, it's interesting that we, we go to 1 Peter 1.20 and it says that, that Jesus Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world. To do what? To die on the cross. That means God knew beforehand. You know, nothing caught him by surprise. He knew beforehand what he was going to have to do to redeem us. To redeem means to buy back. In other words, you know, when Adam and Eve, you know, when they were created, they were perfect, sinless, until they chose to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sin, sin entered into the world. And from that point on, we've all been sinners. Uh, that's, uh, that's something we deal with, we live with. Uh, but he shows the riches of his grace toward us. The grace that says, I know what's going to happen, but I'm going to make a way out. So what, what is it that's going to condemn people? Is it the fact that they're ruthless sinners and, and have done all kinds of evil? Well, that's part of it. But the biggest thing is they've rejected God's plan. God's plan of salvation is for all. He's not willing that any should perish. It's for everyone. And when we reject that, just like John 3.36 says, you know, we only, uh, all we can expect, you know, if we don't believe in Jesus Christ, all we can expect is the wrath of God. But why would He be angry? Because He's made the way out for us and we've rejected that. we rejected His plan, His grace. We've said, oh, I, you know, I'm, good, I'm a good person. I can make it on my own. What is that saying about God and about His mercy and His grace toward us. It's saying, we don't need that. You know, there are countless people who think they're going to find heaven some other way than through Jesus Christ. We already talked about that last week, but He is the only way. I just read just this morning about the one man who was executed and his, his uh, spiritual leader was there. A Buddhist monk. Now, I'm sorry. But that's not the way of salvation. And if that's what he was depending on, whatever his Buddhist monk told him, um, he spent an eternity in hell. You know, we, don't, we can't depend on anything, even our own goodness. We can't depend on those things to get us to heaven. And if that's what we're dependent on, you know, we better look at, take a good hard look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 again. Because it, it has nothing to do with our goodness. It's not of works. If it was, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Well, our salvation is the gift of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God forever. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a free gift. We can't earn it, deserve it, be good enough for it. All we can do is receive it because Jesus already paid for it. It's that simple. And you know what? That's what makes it so difficult for some people to believe because it's too simple. It can't be that easy. Well, it is that easy. But then is when the hard work begins. That's when we begin serving Him. We can't serve Him before we trust Him. We can't do anything for Him. He doesn't need our goodness. He says our goodness is like filthy rags to Him. That's how much it counts. It counts for nothing. The only way we can please God is by receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. And it's for this purpose that, that God created us, to have that relationship with Him, to willingly choose to follow Him. 
John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him. Now this is Jesus talking, uh, you know, but as many as received him, to them he gives the power or the right to become a child of God. King James says sons of God, but we know it's a child of God. You know, there's a, I think I mentioned it last week, this, this whole idea we're all children of God, you know, we've got to get along. Well, no, we're not all children of God until we choose to become a child of God, until we choose Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's there, it's offered to us. Now, I know there's a, a thing called election, and there's also free will. And I don't know how those two go together, and I've, try, I've seen other people try to explain it, and you know what? They can't explain it either. Because it's in God's plan. But I do not believe that God elected some to heaven and, and the rest to hell. I believe God knows who's going to receive Him for, from eternity past. He knows. He knows each one by name. And He tells us that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That we belong to Him. That we're going to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Uh, when we're in that book, we're not, He doesn't have an eraser. He doesn't take us out if we don't live up to His standard. You know what? Because it's not based on our living up to His standard. We are to live a, a standard, but like I said, we're going to be judged for how we live that up to that standard. And it even tells us in Romans or in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 that even those who stand before Him have nothing to give to Him. If they've trusted Christ, they're still saved. Uh, it says, yet though as by fire. And I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, I had a pastor one time said that means they make it to heaven but with a scorched hanging. Uh, I don't know that that's correct. <laughs> but I don't know what that means. But you see, God determined beforehand uh, how He was going to play this out. How it was all going to work out. I remember years back a number, probably 12, 14 years ago, we went Al and I went to Grace College to hear this man speak on, uh, I can't think what it was. It's, it, it had to do with uh, the idea that God doesn't, God doesn't know everything. I think I got shut off. Oh, there we go. God doesn't know everything beforehand because He doesn't know the choices that you're going to make. So He has a whole garage full of options depending on what choice you make. And you know, that would make us God more than Him. And that's just not right. Uh, you know, God does know everything ahead of time. He does know what's going to happen. He knows what's going to take place. He knows how this coronavirus is going to play out. He knows everything about it. He's not caught by surprise. But we have to trust Him. We just have to trust Him and believe that whatever He does is going to be best. How we're going to, you know, how we're going to maybe suffer persecution as believers? I don't know. It's possible, depending on how things play out. Um, they'd already like to shut our churches down if they could. They haven't been able to do that. So when we're saved, our works are going to reflect our new relationship. The works reflect who we belong to. Uh, years ago, Irvin Overholzer, who was the founder of Child Evangelism, um, he came out of the Dunkard Brethren background, which was more a more works-related salvation. And he taught that you know you're saved by your works. And then he, he he finally realized that after he got a hold of some of these scriptures, he thought, you know what? We're not saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of God. But we're kept by our works. We're kept saved by our works. That's what, he, that's what he thought. And he said, for 16 years I preached that. And he said, then the Lord really woke me up to the fact that, you know what, we're kept saved the same way we are saved, and that's by the grace of God. If it were up to us to live up to a standard to keep saved, I guarantee you every one of us would lose it. But we can't because it's not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus Christ has already done and the, the fact that we've accepted that. And the grace of God keeps us saved. You know, he said back in John 10, uh, I should have looked it up, it's 10, 28, I believe. Uh, let me look it up here. Sometimes when you're up here, you, things come to mind that you had planned on, you know? <laughs> uh, let me see here. Yeah. 
Um, Jesus talking about knowing his sheep. I'll go back to verse 22. And now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple uh, in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I will never, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who, is, who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now if they didn't understand that he was God, that made it pretty plain. He was God. And, uh, you know, He saves us. He keeps us. Thank God for that. But that doesn't take our responsibility away. We're to live for Him. Um, and I found this statement I, I like. You've probably seen it before. But it's, heaven is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. It's not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. And that's true. We were guilty. We were as guilty as, and as lost as lost could be. And God gave us the gift of heaven when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, you know, there's a couple of men walking and, and uh, one of them, there's a man walked by him and uh, the one man said to the other, he said, uh, that man was a soldier. He said, how do you know? So I could tell by his walk. Well, you know what? People ought to be able to see us and say, that person's a Christian. I can tell by their walk. You know, that's what Christ wants for us right now. Walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. Walk the walk. Let people see Jesus Christ in us. You know, and, and I know I've used this illustration before, but I think it bears repeating. In, in 155 A.D., Polycarp was the bishop at Smyrna, one of the uh, uh, New Testament churches. The Roman, Roman proconsul before he, whom he was brought sought to show deference to him because of his age. If you will revile Christ, I will set you at liberty. But the age, Polycarp replied, I have served him for 86 years. And he never did me any wrong. How can you expect me now to blaspheme my king and my savior? Well, the proconsul urged him again to swear by the fortune of Caesar. Don't you realize that I have wild beasts at hand? And if you do not repent and change your mind, you'll be thrown to, to them. Bring him in, Polycarp said. We're not accustomed of repenting of goodness in order to do something evil. If you have so much scorn for the beast, perhaps you would prefer the fire. Well, your fire burns for an hour and goes out, he, the old man said. But there's another fire you don't know about. What are you waiting for? Bring forth whatever you like. And so he met his death. He was burned at the stake because he dared to live the new life. And now to him and all those like him, Jesus said, though he die, yet shall he live. Wait for the Lord. What a testimony. You know, those early believers... They had to suffer for Christ, uh, to stand for Christ. Uh, we haven't had to in America. Oh, we, we suffer in subtle ways, being ridiculed maybe, or uh, the news media doesn't like us for the most part, and they'll say things. But you know, people in other countries are giving their lives if they admit to being Christians and serving Christ. They, it, it can cost them their lives. We haven't seen that in America for the most part. But it could come. Are you ready to stand for Christ regardless? Ready to be a polycarp? No. Serving Christ can be costly, but it's worth it. Now this life is, is short. Death is short unless the rapture occurs first. But you know what? It's worth it all. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I 
do thank you for the scripture that we have that reminds us that we are your workmanship. You're working in us to do your good pleasure. But you want to use us. You want us to be all that we can be for you. You want others to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the way you work in our lives. Thank you for holding on to us. Thank you for allowing us to be servants of yours. And I pray if there's anyone here today who's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that this could be the moment that they do that. Just, just tell the Lord, I need Jesus as my Savior. I've never done that. I want you right now. And you know what? He'll answer that prayer. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. We don't deserve it. But we thank you that you're good to us, you're gracious toward us, and that you love us. Do be with Pastor and Jenny and help them to get through this situation and, and uh, bring them back to us soon. We'll give you the praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.